meaning in the R and so forth. So let me start with some of the equipment. Turn in your agenda to and the page is number 21 if you can make that out. And 21 is the uh, plural back. And that insert is in your, now you don't have to read it all and it's too small a print, but that insert is in the Pluribac. When it comes packaged up, the Pluribac, that insert is in there. And um, I told you the next page, which would be, um, you know, some of them are upside down. So it's 20, that was 21. Page 22 was the one Dr. Orca, I told you, was so simplified. Has anybody read it? Yeah. Well, that he uses the bottles, and I think I told you that. His article, because it was 1972, he uses bottles in his description. Well, your bottles are right here. This is, the blue is one bottle. The red is another bottle, and this, the drainage is the third bottle. So it's exactly like Dr. Orcutt's article, but these are your bottles. And we have different types of Pluribax, but they all basically are the same in what they're doing. So they're put in because you've got a leak. You've got a pneumothorax, hemothorax, spontaneous, or whatever, but you've got a, a um, leak, and, and the balloons are, have deflated. At least, praise the Lord, we've got three balloons on one side and two on the other, so when we get a leak, they don't all go. Just one load goes, and that's where we get the chest tube. So the physician's going to put the chest tube in, and when the and I just it's magic. I don't know how somebody came up with it. Somebody just realized that if they put a tube, you know, in the old days I probably would have thought of a leak in the lung. Yeah, that load's gone. But somebody realized you can put a tube in that deflated, and if I put a different pressure at the end of the tube, it'll start going back up. And I think it was really great thinking. So. The physician is putting the tube in, and this is—that's all right. Just leave it. This is going to be what makes that pressure different out here and in there, which makes it start coming back up. So the physician is putting it in, and you go to the supply closet and get the pleurovac. And what you've got to do now, the directions are there. But do you really have time to put your glasses on and sit down and read it? Not really when the physician's putting it in. So that's usually what happens. They say, let me get a pleurovac. I'm going to put a chest tube in. And so I'm telling you what that paper says, which is just simply take it out of its cover. And back here in the back, taped is usually a funnel. Of course, it's gone now. But it's a funnel. If not a funnel, a catheter tip syringe you can go get. When I say catheter tip, it would fit this. Not a needle type lure lock won't fit the end. So if you don't have a funnel, if this one got away without a funnel, go get a 50 milliliter catheter tip syringe. And here's all you do. Get a Sharpie, and here it's zero, write the date. Um, one the day, one twenty six twenty, and the time, uh, fourteen hundred or whatever, and put that at the zero. You've taken care of that bottle. Now, this bottle, if you can see on your little insert, I don't know whether you can read it, but it says right here, fill F I L L, fill just here. Now, let's say I hadn't got time to hunt down a 50 milliliter syringe. This didn't come with a, with a uh, funnel. So I'm just gonna get a syringe, the 
a needle and syringe. Put saline, um, sterile water in it and stick it in this little hole and shoot water to here. I can do it that way or I can do the way it was intended, which was put you want sterile water in a syringe catheter ship and push slowly because if, if you do too much you can't tell this much oh, it's just from there. <coughs> then just take a syringe and aspirate to that line if they my little motto is if they if it was all right to be more or less they wouldn't have put a line to say fail to here so they want it to here they know what the pressure inside, outside needs to be. And it depends on that water level there. So use your syringe here, or use the catheter ship here, and it's just like this, flubbing in the breeze. Put your syringe on, shoot your, and I like sterile water, because if it's sterile saline, it'll start leaving a residue, a, a, you know, like salt leaves. Doesn't hurt anything because it's sterile, but it's cloudy. Now I shouldn't have any water here, when because it goes over to here. So fill to here. Now that's the second bottle, and, and that's the um, the water sealer. That's our sealer. That, and I'm telling you more than I know, but that's called the water sealer. And our final bottle is the suction bottle. The physician says, I don't want any suction. Oh, okay. So, if that's the case, the physician just gets that test, gets that check in the patient, and you have filled filled your water to here. <coughs> We're not using the suction. We're going to use gravity. And you hand the physician the end of this. See, it comes like this. And the physician puts it on the chest tube. You take it, and that's it. The big rule is this needs to stay below the lungs, below the heart. So if it's at the foot of the bed, use your handle but it is part of the bed. Now, he can, Mr. Joe Blow can go walk all he wants to, walk down the hall. It's not a magic thing. That's the reason Dr. Orcutt wrote that article. It's not a scary thing. Look what you did. You wrote down 126.20, and you filled it to here. Now, that's not hard to do, but you do want to nurse it. He asked for gravity which means we're not going to be pushing. So every time you're in this room, this patient's room, and you see collection from his lungs in here, just raise it up and help it. Drain it. That's all you need to do. Just help the gravity. At 7 to 9, when you go off duty, get down on your knees or whenever. I think we, we do eyes and O's. Southern still old time. It's 7 to 3, 3 to 11. 11 to 7. So you, at 3 o'clock this afternoon, you get on your knees and you draw a line, how much you have, and that's your drainage from the lungs. Now, um, and then 11 to night, they'll do the same. The physician tomorrow morning says, I doubt it, you know, this, it's not draining. I still hear, they still got a leak. I don't, I can tell they're not draining like they, they're still full. So let's put some suction on. So what they do then is, uh, so this is to the patient. Can you hold that? So that's to the patient, and he wants suction now. Now this that was flooded in the breeze is going to get an adapter and go to the wall suction. And uh, you can do the little wheel for suction as high as you want to because the physician's going to order how much suction and you just dial it right here with this little dial twist it to whatever amount of suction the patient your doctor wants 
And that's all you do now, any bubbles now. And that's why they would rather us use sterile water, but that bubbling, it makes you kind of cloud. It doesn't hurt anything. So now we're using it. Uh, we'll never empty it, we just mark accurately. And, and it, but it needs to stay upright at all times, and it needs to be below the pipe shelves. You go walk. Now let's say on suction, now I can't walk them. Oh, yes, you can, and please do. We don't want them to get weaker, but they're attached to suction. They were unattached when you, um, when they were gravity. So for the few minutes, and for what it's worth to have exercise, undo the suction and go for your walk. Just keep it down. It's nothing magic. It's not going to put a medial style push. It's going to happen. Now, you had them for a whole day on gravity. So still walk them, even though they're attached to the wall. Um, um, we fell over. And now my column of fluid is in all three. Well, it doesn't need to be thrown away. Just get down and mark it and do some improvising of how much and just kind of start back over. But make a line that when it comes over there, don't count that. But it's just a big bunch of plastic to throw away when it doesn't need to be. But that does happen that it falls over and then all the fluid goes in all of them. Any questions on the floor back? They're all, as I said, the same. Just a little different, but see this one's the same. There's your suction. There's your water seal. Seal to here. And here is your, I, I didn't mean drainage. This is your drainage, water seal, suction. So they're a little different, but basically they're the same. So that's the Fluorovac. And as I said, you've got that insert if you wanted to look at it, but that's what's included with the package. And then read Dr. Arcutt's article on the three and kind of put that in front of you and you see his three bottles and what they're doing for magic that um, it seals the lungs with this pressure that's negative, negative outside the inside makes the, the um, lung. And of course, the lungs adhere around the chest tube and kind of seal and then starts building up and flowing back up. Uh, one little thing, so you don't get embarrassed. I kept seeing one day bubbles like carbonation. The patient was on a chest tube. And when I was down marking my amount, I saw bubbles. And so I told the doctor, and he made me feel foolish. He said, yeah, the patient's got a leak. But the deal is that as long as there's uh, bubbles, the leak is, don't steal that. When it's no more, it shouldn't be leaking, shouldn't be bubbling. But they also bring out, this isn't perfect. It may have, it may not have fit perfect at the factory and it still has some air leakage, this thing. So a, a little idea, if you want, so to speak, is cut clamp off your tubing to the chest tube. And when it's clamped off and stop your suction, if you still have bubbles, it probably is false, a little bit faulty. If it, no bubbles, then we know you still have a leak. You know, just use your, your sense. I wanted to say one more thing on getting a specimen. Um, the physician says, you know, I think I think there's an infection involved, let's, or there's something, let's see. And so you want to get a specimen, and on the tubing to the Thorovac, you have that spot to do it. And so you can put a syringe, a needle, and aspirate some of the fluid. And if you need to clamp it a minute to collect fluid right there, get it there, because you can't get it out of here. 
that drainage is not any place for you to stick a needle and get it. So just plant it right here, let it collect right in there, and then aspirate your specimen for a culture or whatever. Oh, I must see there's one more thing on here I wanted to say. Oh, about changing it. Now we don't empty it. We throw them away. So how long is it going to take? I don't know. However long, how much uh, secretion we're we pulling off. They uh, no, normally a person keeps this about three days. It takes about that long to seal that leaf. And but we still have to a lot of times change them. And so when it's getting close. And I promise you, it'll be right up here when you come on duty, and they'll let you change it. And it's not hard. You know what to do. Go to the storeroom, get one of these, put the time, put fill to here, and then it, then you just clamp it, clamp it, and take it apart. Not up here, but it just is. Just take it apart at one of the sections and put your yearly on it. So it's real simple, but nurses always let it easily be the next shift. All right, that was the pleurovac. And now on your, go to your briefs and turn to the respiratory page. In the briefs, respiratory is on page 24, I believe. And you can kind of check as we as we go over the equipment. Um, all right. I just want to say the canister on the wall. You know, um, the liners are disposable. Just the line. They'd rather not replace all this because it doesn't need to be replaced and it's expensive. It's a lot of plastic to go in the landfill. But the liner, we can replace. Now, I ask that you never go by these numbers for serious charting. You need to empty into a hard container. Remember, always empty significant secretions in a hard container. You say, well, this is hard. Yeah, but it's not accurate because we've got something that can get big or small. So when you change this at your 3 p.m., 11 p.m., 6 in the morning, when you do that, go in the bathroom, take out this, pour, rinse it, and put it back. We don't get another one. That's expensive and not necessary. If you look at the top of this, it helps you. It tells you patient. So this is what goes to the patient. This goes to the vacuum. And that's it. And that's on the wall. So patient and vacuum. Now, um, then why did they put these on here if we can't use them? It's just for glancing. When I was in here, it was at 100. And I was just in here an hour ago. That's why. You don't chart that. What you chart is anytime you want to go take it out, measure it. The accurate measurement has to be in a hard container. Um, and you may have seen people put tape right here. It's not accurate. I don't know. It's just I, I had somebody do a research to see the difference on a mount, you know, Six o'clock it was here. Three o'clock it was here. And then we, so we added up what they had charted, and it wasn't the same as when we, they don't empty it. They just mark it, and it was not the same. So it's not a good habit. It's easier to, to mark a tape here, but it's not as accurate. So empty it when the INO time is right. Rinse it and put it back in here. And we know, try not to ever throw away this or that. So this does.
step back for because it, the filter is not clean. But this we never throw away. Uh, make sure it seems a silly thing to say. Well, one time I was in a room setting it up, and this, when we turned the suction on, started that. And, and I did not say we're And she said, have you got two of these together? No, we just got one. Well, she had her fingernails pried them apart, and we had two of them. So if it ever does that, it's probably because you didn't know that you put two in there. Didn't know it. Didn't think. Didn't mean to. So that's your canister. It's collected. Now, uh, the... Um, Intense spirometer. In the old days, we did uh, blow bottles because we thought they were good. They realized they were rupturing a villi, so they said this is better for people to hold it in their mouth, empty their lungs, empty it, put this in the mouth, and fill up your lungs, and this will this goes up. Uh, a great nurse puts it where they saw it. What puts this thing? Where they saw it go to. So then the next time we say, you got to at least do 3,000. And that's just for you to put and remember. And they're great for telling the family. But make sure they do them right. Some of them just kind of watch TV. They need to be taught how to do it. And that's empty the lungs. And then, and you do that, and then mark it. Um, and so that's the sense from it. I wish we didn't have to buy them. There are a lot of plastics that we put in the landfill, and technically we shouldn't have to if we were good nurses. And that is, you just assess your patient, and then go to the end of the bed and say, "Now just a minute, breathe." With Fill your lungs as full as you can and hold it. Then let it out and push it out. Hold it, let it out, and push it out. It does as good as those. And I told a physician that one time, and he said, you're right, but nurses don't do it. And we don't. We just get so tied up with so many other things to do. And yet, deep breathing is so, so important. When I first got out of school, I worked at night with a nurse, an older nurse, and I remember telling her, so-and-so, I had a tent, it was like midnight, she said, have you deep breathed her? Oh, no, you know, I, not at midnight, no. And she said, go in there and deep breathe her, do it again at two o'clock. It was done. The patient needed deep breathing. It's just not a stressful one. Well, the importance, they lay in bed and just shallow breathe. So you be one of those. That, the best thing is to ask family. They don't have to do that as a counselor. But tell the family, would you just remind them, do it with them. It's good for you too. Because the only time, I think I told you, the only time we deep breathe is running steps or running a hall or voluntarily, like I'm doing now. Okay. Now... When we did the chest tube, the physician put in the chest tube, and we put the pleura back on. Well, they probably, the physician knew they had drainage and needed thorax. But if it's just a pneuma, air, thorax, it's just got air leaking. And there's no secretions involved. And so then the physician might put a Heimlich, like the Heimlich removal, a Heimlich chest tube in. And it looks just like that. They have a new one, but nobody's seen them. I've seen them in books, but I've never seen them out, and nobody else I've talked to have either. So still, I think these are plentiful, the Heimlich chest tube. And they're put in only if you've got a leak that doesn't have secretions, because this is open. This is open. And we don't want secretions pouring out that. That's kind of a penrose drain in there. So the air comes out through the penrose and out. I've seen people try to do 
speaking with and put a glove on it. And I don't have any problem with it because it's not going to go back in, but they think it's cute to see the, glo the gloves blow up during the day, you know, with air coming out. And that's fine. It doesn't hurt anything. And the air didn't want to go back through the pinhead. I did take care of a patient one time, and he was a DNR, do not resuscitate, and he was in the unit, and um, the, but he, we couldn't get an IV in him, and so it meant a central line. The family didn't said that's heroic. They didn't want us to put a, a central line because we couldn't do a peripheral. So we said the only way he can stay in ICU is to have IV access. Nobody stays in ICU without IV access. We can't stay in here unless we do the central line or the partition. So they reluctantly agreed to let the central line be in. He had cancer of the lung. So the physician put um, the central line in, and when he did, which is no fault of his, sometimes the apex of the lung is high and he nicks the, the lung. So now the patient has a minimum thorax. Now, mm -hmm. so my family comes in to visit and we got this thing. I thought you said it was just a, a central line. Look at all this. So the physician put in a high like, and the man had a lot of secretion. But they weren't going to do fluorovac. They weren't going to do that kind of stuff. So the physician put this because it could be under the covers. You know, and this, <laughs> this didn't show. Now he told the family, of course, he had to, that he just made a little neck, but that's no problem. He's, he's taking care of that. Well, I have the man as a patient, and I'm turning him every two hours. And so he had the Heimlich in, and when I turned him, he's always blue to blue. When I turned him, he just poured out over my bed. The secretion was in the lung. So that is just a thing. The next time I put a towel when I turned him, and the towel absorbed everything. It was okay. It just, it's just not put in if you think you're gonna have secretion. So I'm just put it. Now, um, this is a good one. Um, this is your. Um, Plurex is what's listed on page 24 in your briefs. The Plurex. Um, and it's for when the lungs are full and, but they don't have a leak. You know, we know what to do about leaks and secretion. But this is, um, the lungs are fine as far as no leak. They're loaded, loaded with fluid, and usually it's cancer. Um, that has, you know, because if you've got disease or cancer in your lungs, that they just start secretion. The body tries to fight, and so secretions are put out. So, actually, this was um, invented by a physician here uh, years, several years. I won't say ten years ago, maybe a little more, and he was pulmonary, which is interesting, and very fit and defined and young, and he, he ends up with cancer of the lung. Well, he wanted to work as long as he could, so, but he's still up, and he, you know, trying to stay here and work, and he can't breathe very good. So he came up with this, Plurex, or the Denver pump, is also called, and, and here, and I'm going to tell you, I'm getting ready to show you how to do it. And wherever you are, are tomorrow, if somebody said, do you know how to work the Denver pump? Well, Plurex, Plurivac, vacuum, Plurex. They want you to say yes. And here's what you do. Uh, if um, husbands do it, it's not hard. You just have to know what it's doing. They have made an incision into the pleura of the patient. And it's covered and sterile, and but it has the matching tube. Um, and so they, if they're at home, their spouse can do it. 
let's say they came here, they wouldn't come into the hospital because they're full. Well, that's what Dr. Rodriguez was trying to cut out. So everybody doesn't have to come from McMinnville and, and every place around just to have their lungs drained. It's a plura, um, thoracotomy. It's a portable thoracotomy when you take out fluid. So he thought if I just had a way that we could take out my fluid at home. And so he came up with it. I don't know why it's called the Denver Pump. They must have gotten a, um, a grant or something out of Denver. Anyway, um, so let's say you came in because for whatever reason that what didn't one related to your lungs, and it's time you can tell yourself when they're loaded, or the family say, I think I need drainage. And so you order the fluorex. And they come, these come in little bags, sterile. And it's of course covered, the end is covered because it's a sterile deal. And nothing's in it. And so you're ready to do it. That comes separate. Then you have a tray, a Plurex tray. And I just want you to hear the word. You use it as it's layered. So just don't go digging and, and scratching around. <laughs> use it as it's layered. So you open it and it has some swabs for you to take off the, the, the bandage of the patient. Take it off. They want the clean area. And here's your tube ready to match your tube. And it has a cap on it. And so, and yours has a cap here. Now, go on and clamp it. I like to clamp anything uh, when I'm in transition. Um, I just think it stops everything. We don't, it's not dripping, it's not draining. So I'm gonna put a clamp on this. I've got the next thing, sterile gloves. And they're on that the tray. Put on my sterile gloves. And I wanna take off the cap on this tube. Take off this cap and do a catching. Now nothing's happening because I'm clamped. So I sit here and I'm gonna unclamp and it start filling because it's septic. And it's filling, sometimes it really is filling fast, the pressure. You know, if they were really full, the pressure would be. And there was a sister that would come in here. They didn't do it at the mother house. She'd come in for, for her thoracotomy or her pleurex treatment. And she's the only one that ever asked us to, to, to go, go real slow. She said it hurts. To, you know, so if you need to go slow, just put your little bit of suction, on, I mean, a clamp, and let it drain. How much? Well, this is 500, and it's kind of the same concept as kidneys. You know, when you catheterize somebody, they say, don't take more than a thousand, it's too big to shock on the body. Well, this is kind of the same way, but I don't know if any of you all have ever catheterized anybody and taken more than a thousand. But you do, but you do it slow and gingerly and with mindful thought. I'm getting high here. It just says it shocks the body fast, lose fluid so fast. And they say the same as this. But I'm here to tell you, I feel three of these at one time. And it's because the family say, now that's not enough. You need to do another one. So clamp, get another one. He knows he's doing it at home. He said, I never quit unless it's 1,500, so he does about three of them. So you just have to be mindful that it can be shocking, but do it slow. If they still can't breathe well, then do another. When you're through, of course, clamp it. Take it apart. The tray has another cap for you here. You're going to throw this away at bio, um, biohazard. You put the cap back on, it gives you a, uh, a dressing and um, opaque the covering. I'd mark always the time and date that it was disturbed, and you're fine. So do, couldn't you do it now? It's not hard. And and that's the changing of the fluorex. And, and if you go to home health, uh, they do them a lot. You can always YouTube and probably read about it and how they do it too. That's the deal for it. You go to your car 
can read about. Um, now, let's see. I think I'll do. Um, I could do. Let me let me do the bowl. Your basic um, apparatuses that we breathe by. And so, the granddaddy of all is the nasal cannula. Just the cannula. And you remember the little prongs go back and not stop. So put them there around the ears and they'll deliver. The thing is, you've got this tube attached to your oxygen on the wall. And um, this is your very basic oxygen. And you and I are breathing 21% oxygen. 20, 21. This, for every liter, and you know that oh, the seats and you roll the wheels to go liters of oxygen. Every liter is 4% more oxygen. So, the physician says put them on 2 liters of oxygen. Well, you know now they're getting 20 out here and four, four. So they're breathing 28% oxygen. The, the research says that they can breathe five liters of oxygen without water in humidifier, huma, huma, humidifier. Um, once it's higher than five liters, they say it dries us too much out. So for several years, they dropped back and weren't humidifying oxygen. But the hospital's so dry anyway, they were, it was a mess. And you had more crusty, bleedy mucous membranes. It wasn't worth it. So pretty much everybody is getting humidified oxygen, even if it's two to three liters. So, um, again, let's this delivers one to six liters. That's about all that tubing can handle is one to six liters. So six times four is 24. So 20 out here, 24 through the wall of oxygen, they're getting about 44% uh, oxygen with the cannula. Well, that cannula is rubbing the nares right here. And it's sore and, and raw. And and I don't know whether you've heard it, but it's such, it drives me crazy how scared everybody is for Vaseline because it's an oil base. And that oil is flammable. So one of the hospitals won't even let, you have Vaseline in the hospital because it's oil based and they're afraid to get it around oxygen. Come on. I tell people I have never in 52 years of nursing seen the headlines say hospital exploded because Vaseline <laughs> was used for marriage with oxygen. Now, oh, so I tell people, I just love that. Put a little metal on your, rub it very thin, but it's such a great barrier. Now we've got fancy barriers for excoriated rectums and everything. But, but it's Vaseline glorified and it's costly. Vaseline's cheap. So I see nothing wrong with just a real coat of it there. And then you're married with a front. Now, but let's say, so okay, I can try a mask if you want to. So that's our next one. It's the mask delivering the same thing, only I just don't have the prongs. Um, Oh, so we could go, but I'm telling you, I don't think I've ever known a patient that when I've gone to the mask, they don't want that. They don't want that claustrophobic mask. They'd rather have the front. All right, so those are two. Then this is the Ventura. And so you know we can deliver 44% oxygen with this, those two. The Ventura is, is a wonderful, it's great if you want to look, it's real hard to read. 
but this tells you what liters and what percent it will make it. And the word is, it's the absolute most accurate in delivering oxygen. The physician says I want them to have four liters of such and such percent. That's what it says on this adapter. So you put the adapter in your Ventura, and then the bag of these other adapters taped to the wall, because tomorrow the physician may want to up it, and you've got your adapter, you just put it here. The Ventura, where it's more accurate. It can, it's, uh, oh, we have to look it up. The Ventura can deliver, what does it say on there? Uh, 30 to 60 percent plus room air so we're doing pretty good okay so there's the Ventura now anytime you go in a room and they have a mask like this with a bag it's a rebreather rebreather they are, we're getting close to a ventilator now. Um, we're progressing. And, but there's two kinds of rebreathers. The partial rebreather and the non-rebreather. And I can, if you were, this one isn't accurate, but I've got to tell you, you go visit a friend and you walk in the room and they look like this. Well, I see you've got a rebreather. Now they may not know whether it's a, partial or a non. You can get up and examine if you want to. And you can't on this one because this is just to give you the idea. It's been if but it makes it will give you kind of sense. On the side are a diaphragm. Two little holes. If they're flaps, you exhale and the flap opens and let your air out and flat back down. No way you're going to re-breathe any air. So that's as easy as it gets. If it's kind of open, or they are open, you exhale and inhale, and you get some of this oxygen and some rebreathing. So you're partially rebreathing. So partial rebreathe, uh, you're getting, it says, um, 45 to 70 percent oxygen. Add your room to it too. So it's a partial rebreathe is a good thing. But the thing just before they have to go to a ventilator or it's a non-rebreather. And and you can imagine why, because it's closed off and making you breathe oxygen. No rebreathing of any air. No rebreathing. So uh, the non-rebreather will deliver up to 70 to 100%. So just slip over and visit with your friend and look at the diaphragm on the side and you'll know if it's a partial or a non. And you'll know how sick they are. If they're on a non, they are really not refusing oxygen so well. So now, the physician is not pleased with O2 sap, not pleased with the arterial blood gases, so we've just got to get them on a ventilator. So they're put on a ventilator, the E-tube has to be put in, or if they have a trach, that has to be put in. But they've got the E-tube. Um, and Are strong things, aren't they? <laughs> so, so um, let's say that that is in the E tube, I, um, and, and that's the one thing nurses can do it, but we're not doing it like we used to. Several years ago, many years ago, when I took ACLS, this was part of our, part of passing ACLS adult cardiac life support. And you have to do it every two years. I still have to do it every two years, but um, we don't pass ETUs anymore. 
Um, not because we couldn't, but the nurses can, but they really leave it up to respiratory and the physicians. And so they're put down. And with and, and let me just say, they're blown up with a syringe, and if the cuff the cuff is sealed at the end. Now we're gonna go on and put tape around it and or velcro and hold it in. But this seals it so that when air is pushed in, it doesn't go to the end and come back out. It goes to the lung. So, or the, and that's lung goes in lung. So, if this is flat out here, the, the cuff is flat, the ball is flat. If that's big and puffy, then this is big and puffy. You can't see it. So, the E tube is now in. And if this patient was fairly conscious, then we may have to sedate him because he will, his reflex is to get it out. So now the physician has him on a ventilator, respirator ventilator. And uh, we're going to talk about this later. Um, all right. So, you have your ventilator, respirator, or whatever, and the physician has told you what knob to put on what. And I'm going to tell you the different ones, and they make sense, um, FIO2, fractured, inspired O2. Well, that means a portion of inspired and here's what I want. The physician says 40%. Well, you just go to the dashboard of the respirator and turn it to 40. That's how easy it is. You say, well, I thought respiratory does it. Hey, they do, but they may not be there at the moment we're doing it. And hey, turn the switch to 40. FIO2, 40. Um, then the uh, physician on this dashboard, it says rate. And the physician wants the patient breathing on his own. They're not doing so good. I mean, they do it all right, but the physician says, I really want them to breathe more than they're doing, at least eight a minute. And this patient isn't doing eight a minute. So I know because there's a, a spot on the dashboard that says rate, and it's it's the here and now. See, the physician wants eight. So <coughs> you find another spot in the respirator, and it says um, M M ah, MDI mandatory, mandatory inspired respiration MIR. It's mandatory though. I'm not getting the right letters, but it's mandatory. And the machine, he, the physician said, I want eight. And the mandatory tells you what that the machine is made to make him, make him breathe at least eight. And if you were charting him every hour, you look at his rate, oh, it's 10. He's breathing 10. But eight are mandatory. And so he's breathing two on his own. And you chart it as MDI. Mandatory, well, I said it wrong, but anyway, whatever it's under, the mandatory part, a mandatory eight slash 10. So people know eight slash 10 is mandatory is eight, he's breathing 10. So then the physician knows he's at least breathing a little on his own. And then um, the next one, is um, um, oh I love this one now, I was going to tell you all I love um, MDI see. I'll get them in a minute um, CPAP continuous pressure 
what do you do? Be passive. Continuous positive pressure. What? Continuous, positive Continuous pressure. positive. What? Airway pressure. Positive airway pressure. Be passive. And you know you have to be a conscious individual. I mean, you can't be comatose. You can sleep with them. But you have to be breathing on your own spontaneously. And um, um, if that's if the position you're doing better, and so is the patient. If the doctor now has written um, CPAP, then they'll be off um, the mandatory. And then there's one more synchronized SMIB. Synchronized mandatory inspired ventilation. SMIB. Synchronized, and that means that if they're not doing evenly, the machine makes them, squeezes in a breath. Now, I love the um, CPAP. C, no, not CPAP. PEEP. P E E P. Positive expired. Positive expired end pressure. Positive expired end E N D pressure. And here's what somebody discovered. Now here's their V line, and the ventilator pushes air in, and the V line opens, pushes good oxygen diffused, and then the ventilator lets off, and that's what you and I are doing. We take a deep breath, it opens, diffuses, we exhale, and we go back down. If you've got a disease or sticky a V line, the ventilator pushes in, opens, and then you exhale and it comes back down. But the next time, it may be so sticky, it can't get in. Mm -hmm. So the physician realizes that and puts them on PEEP. And you're pretty sick if you're on PEEP. So what it does, I think it's so clever. The air comes in, blows up their v and then leaves some of the air in so that it doesn't come back too sick. Isn't that mm -hmm. clever? So peep, they're pretty sick because the physician's scared that we can't get it open again. So let's keep it kind of quasi open. Isn't that clever? So the physician orders peep. Um, let me see now. Okay. Um, now, before we, we want to take a break, but before we do, I want to go over one more thing, and that is that, oh yes, more than one. I went on left this Ballard, or it's, a, it's just like that, laying in the bed with him. He does have a cap on it, but it's just laying in the bed. Now, hopefully, respiratory move changes all this out every 24 because of pseudomonas. The water buzz. Because as sterile as it is, pseudomonas gets in there and in 24 hours starts growing. And so, and oh, one, two more dials on your respiratory dash are high pressure alarm. And that is just what it says. The lungs and the tubing is under high pressure. And why is it? Because its pressure has increased in this tube. Why? Because probably you've got either a kink and the pressure's building up, or we've got, if they, the pressure's building up, or I don't have it on here, but water condenses so in here. And the water fills up this little curve right here. It can't get through, air can't get through. So it's high pressure because it can't get through. It, the pressure keeps going higher and higher to try to get through. But the water has collected. And I, I, in the old 
days we used to undo them and just do it in the waste can. Nowadays they have a little bag mm -hmm. you can, if you'll just aim it, the water will go in the bag. So your high pressure is on. So go over and look for where in the core, in the tubing, is there building up high pressure? First off, silence the thing. Just push that silence button and um, look for where the high pressure is. Is it pink or is it filled water? The other dashboard thing is low pressure. Well, it's just what it says. The pressure's not going through. My heart, it's undone. It, it, when I look close, it gets undone from the machine. So the pressure's so low. Just push it back in. So those are two of the deals on the that, uh, items on the dash. And then um, the Ballard um, is, is the suctioning. And I'm going to go over suction in this. And then we'll break a minute and let's go over suctioning, just old time suctioning. So the position, this is changed out every 24, so it's not going to grow a lot of stuff. But this is sterile in there, and I'm going to use it all day to suction. And if I want to, because it's so thick, I can open this little sidebar and squeeze saline in there and push a button on the dash that says 100% oxygen. And then that might give him 160 oxygen, 100% oxygen, that's been hum humidified. So there is that. I'm ready to suction him. And uh, the biggest thing is his mouth, he could cough. So you don't want to be in his line of cough. So I'm ready to go down, and I tell him I'm going to suction him. So I just go down, and it's going nicely. It may give me a little problem just if it goes out of the issue. And I, he's fine with me going down, because he can still breathe around through his nose. He's not hypoxic till I start pulling oxygen off of him. And so this is locked. You have to turn it. And then it, it can now be suctioned. The thought is that they lay on it in bed, so they lock it. I'm ready now. And now I'm going to tell him. Uh, and he may, I may have hit the gag reflex right here. And he's coughing. That's fine. Don't come out because he's coughing. He's red-faced. Just go. And you want to take 12 seconds. Don't count. He'll probably slap you. But just, just. Now he's calmer, but he's coughing. That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted him to cough up here. I can see some mucus in here. Just go right there and suction right there. To get all that mucus that he coughed in here. Probably coughed out. I'm going to push the button for 100% oxygen. Now, what you didn't know I was doing, this is usually clear. I looked at how much was coming out. It's in the canister, but it's a whole day's worth in there, a day's worth. So it's not accurate, but I'll tell you this was full, and this is like five tuberculum syringes. So if that was full, I'm going to say to myself, well, that was thick and it was yellow, and it's about five milliliters, and it's in the canister. I'm letting him have 100% oxygen and calm down. I'm going to go again. And if I did so good, that's why I'm going again. If I didn't do very good, but I'm going on down. He's not coughing yet. Probably till it comes out of the issue. And now I'm ready again. I'm not just jerking it. I want it to be good. He's coughing. Do I want to put a little more humidifying? I can if I want to. So I may put a little bit, push 100% oxygen. Let's rest a minute. How much did I get that time? About half as much. So I'm going to say two more milliliters. My limit is three. I'm still productive. And as long as I'm in it, I'm going to go my third time. Sometimes if you don't get anything the next time, don't. It's, it's fairly traumatic. It, they become epoxic. When I'm doing that, they're 
you're losing um, neurons. Um, and we don't want those tumors. So you don't do it a lot unnecessarily, but they're toxic. So you want it to be working. And I want to do it one more time because we've done so good. So I'll do it one more time, give him a minute, do it a third time, and the same experience. Now one time, 100% oxygen, I got about two at the end, that's enough. So I got, what, about five and two and two, um, about approximately 10 milliliters of thick is the color, the thickness, or the consistency, I mean it fits to your ability, the amount that you got out. That's it, I'm going to take the tubing off of this, put it up on the wall again, put the cap on this and lock it and it's what we like in bed with it. Now, um, this all, let's see, there was something else I wanted to say. Well, I do want to tell you this. The physician wants to know if anything's growing in the mucous membrane. So he says, let's get a specimen. So, um, I'm going to, uh, number one, it's a, the Lucan's cube, you see here, a mucus collection device with a suction trap. I have this. On the dashboard is IMV, intermittent mandatory ventilation. IMV, intermittent mandatory ventilation. Intermittent <coughs> IMV. And then SIMV is synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. Synchronized. Intermittent mandatory ventilation. IMV. I think that CPAP we talked about continuous positive air pressure. The patient has to be breathing on their own for CPAP. That's what people use at home when they snore and to keep them from being apneic. Right. That I wanted to say, and then I wanted just to. Yonkers, remember? Mm -hmm. The Yonkers. Mm -hmm. you know, call it by its name. The other mucus trap, Lucan's, that would go into the tube, into the tube, and it's collected. It's a trap. So it's just another mucus trap or Lucan's tube to collect your specimen. And when you collect it, put the cap on it and it goes to the lab like that. The Lucan's tube. If you have any mask or apparatus that has something that looks like it holds medicine, it probably does, and you prob you wouldn't be doing it, not even nurses. Inhalation therapy will do it, but I just want you to know medicine's put in there for their breathing. 
And then the metered, metered dose, um, metered, MD, metered dose in, uh, in mm -hmm. insulation. Mm -hmm. And you know, you put the cup, the puffer of the, on this end. And I don't know many people that, oh, I'm sorry. You know, the puff mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. got, if the physician wants a metered dose, inhaler, this is what it is. It goes here instead of your mouth. And then I, I wish people did them right, but I don't worry about it. I've got better worries than trying to teach them. So often they watch TV and just go, you know, and it's just in their mouth and they swallow the medicine. And I, I say to myself, maybe it's doing some good. But you, they put it in their mouth and tell them to empty their lungs. And then now, when I push this, make a big breath. And stop. Still in here, a lot of it is still here. Let it out and breathe. They got a little to work on. So the biggest thing is emptying your lungs and squeezing the puffer at the same time that you inhale it. I mean, it's just a technique that not many I see do well. So I'm not sure I put a lot of weight on inhalers, but then I hadn't had any problem either. Um, I, I just have to mention, you know, nursing, mouth care is nursing, and you know, they've got an E-tube with tape all around, they're on the ventilator, and people take these sponges and put them under water and call it mouth care. And I told there's a nurse up here, and I said something, and she said, she overheard me talking to a student on mouth care. And I said, Piola, tomorrow morning, take one of these home, and when you wake up from bed, do it and see if that's enough mouth care for you. Well, of course it is. That is not mouth care. So what do you, you just invent anything to clean people's mouths when they're occupied with tubes or any, and it might be even a tongue blade with washcloth and sepacol on it and get over there and rub those gums and try to, here's the cue, try to get the tongue, rub the tongue, change your cloth and do it over here. I'm going to tell you, comatose will try to open and let you do it. They want their mouth clean. We get them sometimes from the unit and I'm not dissing the unit, I'm just saying they think they've got bigger fish to fry, but they come to us and if you look in with a black box, you can see it's coated back there and we'll grab holes and can put clump, just a clump of dried mucus from air breathing through a tube. So all the mucus around it just dries. And you pull out that, it helps a lot of breathing. So I just can't emphasize mouth care. And, and you're a new man. You won when your mouth's clean. So I just want to say this is not mouth care. I love them after your mouth's been cleaned. I think it's great to clean a person. And that's, whether they've got an E-tube in or not, just good cleaning of gums and tongue. And then end with this. It tastes good and makes refreshment. Now, I think what we lack on this demonstration part is the suction in the trach. And, and so the most simple of suction, we've already done suctioning with the um, e with the mm -hmm. but this is the cheapest, and it comes with a cannula or catheter and a little dish to put your water or saline in, or whatever you're using. So we open it, and we sure don't take this with our hands. And if I had some, if I had some gloves handy, I'm gonna put them on. Um, and and um, this probably isn't going to be sterile this minute. I mean, in real life. Let's say I'm real life, and I'm getting ready to suction this patient <coughs> because I'm I'm getting ready to take the tubing, the suction apparatus, and I'm going to put it right here and turn on the suction. Now, um, it may be an e tube. 
it may be a trait, but um, let's say that we've got the suction in each of these. And so uh, they're not even on, we're going to put them on the ventilator. They're just got their equal. And I want to suction with that little cup. So I'm going to pick it up. I hate, I'm not sterile. I'm going to pick it up. The inside is sterile. And I want to keep that sterile. I just put it there. I pour my saline or my water in. But I'm going to save my cannula for sterile. So now I'm going to put on sterile gloves. And I pick this up because I'm sterile. And I'm going to wrap it around my and the tubing that I turned on and put right here, it's running. I just pick it up and push it in here. I've lost sterility with my left hand. That's fine. And there's my hole for the vacuum that I'll put my finger over, but I don't want to put it over as I go down. Remember, we don't want them hypoxic as I go down. So I am going to give a little water to lubricate inside. So I go. Now don't stand there and take your whole cup of water. Now I ain't got any more. <coughs> Just enough to lubricate inside. I don't need any more ointment, but I'm ready now to go down to each of you. And so my step hand sterile. I go down just like I did. Hold that chain. So I just do the same I did with the uh, Ballard. And uh, now he's coughing, and it's coughing, and it's steely. So now I am going to put my finger over, and I go, and now I touch it all I want to because I'm sterile. And he, I, I'm sterile to him. And he's coughing, so I'm going to clear this out. I saw how many. Did y'all look? See, I had about five. I'm going to give it a second. But he's coughed so. I'm going to do this right in here and get some of that mucus that's right there. Okay, I'm going to give you a second, catch your breath. Now go down again. Do the same thing we did with the Ballard. Just give him a second. I don't think I'm going to do it a third time. But I got about five total <coughs> charted. Six and consistency, color, amount. Um, and of course, if I need a specimen, I put it in layer and the tubing for the liquid. I'm through with this. We don't have any. I'm going to throw it all away. And, and now I got to keep the Ballard for 24 hours, but that was because it was covered in felt in the plastic. So that's the cheapest of all. And um, now, what do we use in a nursing home? They've got the budget, the nursing homes. They, they've gone to all them to a kit that when I open it, they've got the camera, but they've already got my water in the water. And so let me open it with regular blood. My tubing's here, turn it on, suction. And I, don't, I need to open this so I can that cannula in there. Okay, open that, and now put my sterile gloves on. Pick this up. I'm going to lose sterility. The hand, I'm going down with my right hand, so I'll lose sterility with the left. So that's just a little more high price kit for suction. Now, all right, now, oh, one thing I do want to tell you, I learned, I was watching, we had a patient, we were suctioning, excuse me, and the respiratory ran in and did it before we did, and that's fine, but he did. You know how I was going. And he did. 
straight through. He never intermittent. So I learned you could do it either way. So I said to him, talk to me. Tell me why you do it. You know, he's respiratory. He must know more. And I said, tell me why you do it in one firm squeeze rather than uh, intermittent. I said, I know you can do both, but is there a reason you he said, No, probably you're doing it better than I am. He said, I just get tired of doing it the same way every time. So I'm just saying you can do either. I think if I were going to kick a ball down a long haul, I get better results if I kick it along the way than one time. I don't know that that analogy is any good, but that's what I'm asking. So either way. Now, let's go to the trach. And technically, they would like for this EQ. Now, they, I say this, so I'm, I'm stating you. They don't like an EQ to stay longer than three weeks. They, it's irritant. It's irritating. You know, rubbing, and that we're supposed to. Sometimes they, we used to deflate the bulb every 12 out, every 24, so it wouldn't keep rubbing and cause a fistula. Now they say the material is such it doesn't cause a fistula, and we don't have to do that. So we don't have to deflate, reflate. But they don't want us to keep them in forever. Well, they need <coughs> help, so they got to have some help, and so we go to the train. And so we take the trach, and it'll be, of course, it has to be inserted. And uh, we now have disposable entertainers, but we in the hospital don't use them. Nursing homes give out the money and use them. You just squeeze, take it out, throw it away, put a new one in. That's real easy. We, uh, but it's expensive. Now, I do notice nursing homes throw one away in the morning and life's busy, busy, busy. At night, the night shifts, so often they'll clean them like we're getting ready to clean them. Even though it's disposable, they'll only buy one a day. So mostly I've done the study nursing home. Um, now, um, now, I thought I had one more trace. So, um, the tray cup is the same story. It, if it's inflated and snug, air is going down and not coming up. It'll come out your nose or out the ET, I mean the tray tube. Um, now, if I suction, I do the same way. I tell you what I've noticed through the years. It doesn't make any sense, but it, for whatever reason, it, the patients always seem to suction better when I leave the cannula in and suction, uh, rather than during work, the cleaning of it and suction. And I don't know why, but actually with the tech, we, were, we had this cleaning over here in our dish and we were trying to suction, and it'd get hung up. I don't know why, but it would get, and this tech saw us doing it, she said, I just never suction if I don't have the cannula in. She said, if you can get past that, whatever, that's fine, but I just find it never gets caught if you keep that in. So we would just suction just like we did. But now I'm ready to clean this cannula, and so, and if you're at this hospital, you know, I think it's morning and night, use it real. And um, cannulas, we don't throw them away. Nursing homes, maybe we clean it just once. So the cleaning has not changed a lot. Um, the, three, the three layered um, baskets. Are y'all familiar or stainless steel? They're stacked. They come to you, and inside is all you need gloves, pipe cleaner, a suction tube. Um, and um, uh, brushes. And, and so that might be stacks, and 
unsterilely. I had to put them You just take them apart. Two are empty, and one has all your supplies. So I've got three of these. You see the three? This container came with all three together, but they can come stacked. So I've got all three out here. One is holding all the supplies, and the other two are empty. So now my two empty, I'm going to put saline in one, or sterile water, whichever, and then peroxide or glyphosate in the other one. A cleanser, not a, a it's not going to, they say it's bacterial static, we try to keep bacteria down. It's not kind of an antibiotic solution. So you use hexa, hexa thing or whatever. I say X or uh, what was the other one I said? Proxide. Uh, yeah. Proxide or Vice X. So now um, I'm going to, I've got the solution in the back, in the cups. And here is his tray. And I just suctioned him. We just got through suctioning. So now I'm going to clean this in a candle. Anchor, he's got it tied or velcro. Um, hold it because when you wiggle it, it's going to make it cough. And I like that because it's going to, but I don't want it in my face. So, yes, I keep it tied, but still hold it. Unlock it. Now, I've got my two solutions. I want to put it in my, my cleaning solution, Vice Hex or um, um, Proxax. Now here's what I did, I learned I was the first to do it. No, I never understood why people dropped it in the sink, in the solution. When the outside was dirty and it picked up everything, and now I put it in a cleanser, it's not really going to kill, it cleans, but it doesn't kill. And that always was wearisome to me that, I wasn't even thought of E. coli, you know, they're down there adjusting stuff. And then they're watching TV and touch this. I got E. coli on there, and now it's going to be inside. Well, now they said don't do that, which I thought at the time, this is odd that we're dropping it. What would I do? I leaned it up against the side of the, oh, it fell. Well, I have to fall, that's, that's what it does. But leave it up and keep the unsterile out and let it be kind of cooking. And while it's cooking, I can, now I'm unsterile. And I'm gonna stay unsterile. I don't need to be sterile. But I'm gonna stay unsterile, and I'm gonna pick up, oh, oh and it fell in the little thing, that's okay. It's not like I got, let's say it fell, oh, it fell on the floor. Okay, that's all right too, not all right. But we're not going to call the doctor to put a new one in. You take the what fell on the floor, go to the bathroom, and you clean it good with the hand soap and hot water. You know, that hand soap is pretty toxic. So clean it up good. And now I'm going to do it again. And I picked these up. They're sterile. They were in here. My hand is not sterile. I told you I'm using non-sterile this time non-sterile, and I'm doing only the one end is unsterile. So I'm going to lay them here, and I do need to, I've got some four by fours in here too, and they're not sterile either. I'm going to take one of those, and I just clean, got another parachute, all the sort of clean around this tray, mucus, Clean now, uh, so I'm ready now to pick this up by its unsterile end. That I want to keep as sterile as I can. Now I said that, and I just dropped it on the floor. But I'm telling you, that's just the, the thing that went. I cleaned it best I could, and I'm calling it sterile again. They really kind of call them clean, but we try to say sterile. So pick your cute. Uh, pipe cleaner up. Dip it in your peroxide, always from the bottom, 
and there's mucus in there. And I am unsterile here touching so I cannot push it through. Do you know that mucus is just riding with me? It's no good. I mean, that's a lie, but it's worthless. I'm fortunate because I know that this brush does fit. So often, brushes don't. Put it in the bucket. Again, start from the bottom. Now that mucus is pushing, pushing up, and it's all up in there. Well, this isn't sterile anyway, so I'm going to get a Q-tip by the end, that's sterile, and just clean that mucus right there, because that, you know, it's just something. I'm trying my best to keep this as sterile as possible. Really, that's all I need, because my brush works so good. So now I want to rinse it in the saline, and then hold it, and insert it, and lock. And that's it. Now, I have done it when that mucus, the brush doesn't work and the mucus is so thick that I think I'll be sterile. I did them this morning. It was awful. I want to do it sterile this time. So here's what I do. Everything's the same. I take the cannula out. I put it here to be boiling. And now I'm going to put my sterile gloves on, sterilely. They don't have to be double layered, but that's okay. I put them on. I'm now sterile. Let's say it's not sterile. I am picking this up not all sterility, just because, you know, that's dirty. This is, this is sterile. So I want to pick up my pipe cleaner anywhere I want to pick it up. A minute ago, I had to, oh, right there. Anywhere I, a minute ago, I had to just touch the end. But the whole thing's sterile, and my hand's sterile. So I'm going to put it in thick mucus. But because I'm sterile, I can push it completely through, take my sterile hand and touch that, and bring it out. Go back, don't pick up a Q-tip down, do it again, because you're dirty. Dirty to dirty, sterile to sterile. Q-tips all the way up. I'm going to put it in. Push it all the way through. So why do that? Only if you didn't have a good brush, then tonight when I do it, I'll think that I need to do it still. Go back. You look good. Rinse. Go back in. That's how, oh, now what? Here, important. I may have already mentioned it last week. Never cut. This came this way. Already saved. Never cut a four by four because the little filaments will go into the wound. They may close off and start festering. This never. Those little fractures go into the tray. So this comes ready for you. Put it around that tray. Now let's say. You accidentally got one wet, now we're so good. Just fold two of them and put them around the tray. And then, of course, in there is a ribbon. They're still doing ribbons. I've been done with them for 50 years. I've been doing, but they also do Velcro. They don't put them in the kit, but you can order a Velcro tie. Uh, any questions on? One of the most popular questions I get is about eating breakfast. Some people prefer to skip it or don't feel hungry in the morning. Others love eating breakfast and say it's their favorite food of the day. So is the claim that breakfast is the most important meal of the day true or not? It's supposedly our lungs are the only organs that are outside our body because they really are. They are just absolutely connected to the outside and none of our or other organs are. Uh, we 
Yeah, the three loads, we talked about how wonderful to have the three loads on the right and two on the left, and that if something's injured, we still got four more loads. Uh, you know that our trace is about four inches long, and then it branches to the lobes. And the lobes consist of those cells that are a V line that when air gets in them, they do the exchange. They exchange the oxygen for the carbon dioxide. And then when the carbon dioxide comes in, they're put on. They breathe, breathe, <coughs> and the body's connected that way. Praise the Lord, the lungs get rid of that waste CO2. It's a miracle. Um, we need a pint of fluid a day just to keep our respiratory system moist. And that's what I think, people don't realize how important fluids are, because a pint is used just for that. Um, and then, um, people say, when we talk about blood gases in a minute, it's, you know, we love oxygen, but CO2 keeps us breathing because when that gets low, it triggers <coughs> us to take a breath. And, and so consequently, we've got barrel receptors that when our blood pressure goes down, the, the barrel receptors are receptors in our brain that make us take breath more often. Um, and then, um, I wanted to tell you um, a little bit more, I think, out, just so fascinating <coughs> about the lungs. If you took the surface of these three lobes and the two lobes, opened them up, spread them out, the surface area equals a half a tennis court. Now is that an unbelievable amount of service area? Surface area <coughs> in the lungs to spread it out would be a half a tennis court. Um, the um, um, when um, germs and virus we have and we already know this, but the cilia are lining our lobes inside. You know, at the base of the of villi, we've got a cilia, a, a hair that is moving, and its primary job is just to keep us clean. And it moves like that wave in football. Remember that wave that would go through the stadium, a wave, and that. Our cilia start at the bottom and do that wave, working just pollen, everything up and out. And I think it's so fascinating that they work 100% of the time at night when we sleep as much as daytime. Our blood vessels, uh, sleep, they cut down about 90% at night as far as activity, but our cilia stay busy. How fast, and I just memorize it because it's just fascinating to me. 931 times a minute they're moving, the cilia. That's 12 times a second that they're moving. Pulmonary torsion, trying to keep our lungs, because it's like they're outside and the body is at its best to get clean. So that that exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide doesn't get betrayed. Um, I, I, this uh, a man who was teaching, I went to some of his lectures, and he, he was teaching about cilia hair, and he said, three puffs of a cigarette paralyzes those cilia. Three puffs inhale, paralyze them. And they, they wake back up after the person's finished the cigarette 
And I later asked him, I heard him speak to his family. I asked him, I said, well, how quick do they wake back up? And he said, you know, we can't pinpoint it because it depends on the heaviness of the nicotine and the inhalation of the tobacco. <laughs> and so he said, we don't really, and then when did you like the next one? You see it, or whatever. And so, but they wake back up. Now the bad part is, but then they paralyze them with the next cigarette, or cigar, or pipe, or what. They can inhale. Now, um, the malice, the problem is the tar that's in tobacco. Because the tar begins to build up at the base of the cilia, and they can still do this. They can still wave for a long time, years. But then pretty soon they're buried. And so, but the body is so compensatory that there's another mechanism. And that is that we secrete, if we can't keep our lungs clean with this, the body knows that and makes us secrete more that drip. And the dripping in the respiratory system because of the heavy secretion makes us cough. And the coughing is the pulmonary quality. Isn't that amazing? Who makes your smokers cough? The person has destroyed that cleaning. So now the drip makes the smoker cough. I think that's so wonderful how the body tries its best. I heard a physician one time said the body wants to be normal so bad it'll do anything to try to stay normal. Um, and that is keep our lungs clean. Um, now, it takes you and I about 3% of our energy to breathe. You're not even thinking about it, and I'm not either. But if your lungs are empty, then it will take as much as 30%, 33% to be exact, of your energy to breathe. And if you didn't know this, um, a, real, a person who really has uh, COPD or chronic pulmonary problems, they're not obese because they warm their, they keep their, their calories, just stay down with the energy. They're staying active enough, but their breathing is taking a third of their energy. So, uh-huh. Mary, I'm sure you're familiar with this one. This one, what causes Interstitial lung disease. Interstitial what? Lung disease. Interstitial what? Interstitial lung disease. Oh, what causes interstitial lung disease? I don't know. I really. Because they're not smoking and they're not smoking. They're not smoking. They don't smoke. They just have the disease. I don't know. Isn't it crazy? So many things we can get. And there's just not enough written about it, I don't think. Um, um, COPD, the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it, it can be just that, pulmonary problems, but it can be emphysema, it could be congestive heart failure, mm. but the point is it's chronic pul uh, pulmonary, obstructive pulmonary disease um, problems. We, we just aren't exchanging um, the gases properly. And um, if it's emphysema, what do they say? It's your energy is pushing air out. It's not hard to breathe in, but it doesn't automatically ex expel. And you have to push it out, and consequently you get the barrel because you're using those muscles to push your air out. Um, congestive heart failure, We'll just speak to that a minute because obviously the heart's our culprit and it's just not pumping good enough. Praise the Lord, we've got those meds we just went over that kind of help that contraction. But if you're dyspneic, a little air hungry, that heart probably is not pushing the air through, through the lungs because it's the lungs having a problem because you're air hungry or you're having dyspnea. So, yeah, it's the heart, but it's a 
expecting to learn. And so you go to the doctor, I can't breathe, I don't know what's going on. They check you and say, well, your heart's your issue. You're getting congested in your lungs because the heart can't beat so good. It's, it's not as proficient. So I'm going to put you on Redoxin and make that kind of the first choice. Make those contractions great. And in doing that, I'm going to give you a diuretic so the heart doesn't have to work so hard. So a cardiac patient with dyspnea usually just starts on a great cardiac drug and a diuretic. And that can last a while. Now they may have, they'll come back every six months or whatever, but they may have to have a, a higher dose of their diuretic and their lanoxin. And they can do that a while. Dyspnea is the first sign of congestive heart failure. But then the doctor looks at them this time. It's been about two years you've been my patient. And you know, they always look at your ankles. You're swollen. And you run swollen six months ago. That means the heart is, is um, you've got heart disease. Your heart, well you had it anyway, but it's worsening. Because now the muscle, even on the medicine, can't get the fluid from the feet back. It's settling down there. The pump just is, you're the nine, we don't have swollen legs. Our pump is getting it back and going again. But if it's settling down there, that pump is losing some of it. So the physician puts them on another drug that helps that pumping, helps that another cardiogenic, maybe we're on two now, cardiogenic drugs, trying to help that pump, that contraction. And and then I'm gonna they're gonna put you on a higher diuretic to try to clear all of that fluid. Because you're collecting fluid. And we need to get the fluid out so your heart can maybe beat a little better. And then, and I think I brought it up last week, I think I did, turn in your briefs to medicine. And that I want to say, what page is medicine in the briefs? Did I mention it last week? We don't have it marked, so I must not have. Zeroxalin is, is wonderful. It's sad, but it's wonderful. Zeroxalin enhances diuretics. You never get zeroxalin by itself, but it's the last resort. The physician has got you on high lasix, got you on high um, cardiac drugs, and you're just not doing, you're not improving a lot. So then the physician orders the Roxalin. And that is a miracle. You just go down, you're at it. But it doesn't last forever. It is, but it's a drug that will enhance, and they don't usually use it until the, I don't mean the end of your life, but kind of the end of your treatment. And after, you can still live a while, of course, but I'm just telling you. One physician I know, he took a congestive heart patient and he just fluid prescription down to hardly any fluid. Cardiac drug <clears throat> really bad. I mean, dehydrated and then they didn't do anything he wanted to. He hoped that the heart would be jarred and start beating a little better. And it did for about 10 more months. In all kinds of ways. All right, now let me see if there's anything else I want to say. I think that's what I want to say right there. Now, we've been over the ventilator. Uh, breath sound, breath sound, I'm going to say. Um, we, you can say rails and wrong tie, but 
We're not using them much anymore. Because it's hard for people to get in mind, too. I could, I'd always have to grief myself if I tried to teach it. Because it's hard to make a lot of strong time, really. They'd like for us now just to say, please, which is dry, and then crackles that are wet, and then friction rub, and you can tell if something's rough, you know, like it's rubbing. And then the word audible, audible air passage. Well, we don't like to say normal or within normal limits, so we just say audible air passage. Or as you're breathing, normal. Um, I think we all know apnea, A, is always without, T, N, E, A, no breathing. Uh, and then brady, mitnia, bradypnea, slow breathing, brady. I do want to mention chain stoking, C H E Y N E. C-H-E-Y-N-E hyphen stoked. It usually means, it doesn't have to mean death, but it's serious. And it, it's crescendo of their apneic. We think they're gone. When they start out barely, a little more, and it's a crescendo when they get high and then they start slowing down, slowing down, and they go at me again. And so it's a wreck. I think it's an interesting definition. It's regular, irregular. Because that isn't even look right, great to breathe in, but it is regular. They, they don't just do it shorter next time or fast. It's pretty regular. Um, and a lot of times there's a death rattle in it, too. But it doesn't always mean you're about to die. Dyspnea, we already know difficulty. I want you to be familiar with Kushmar, K U S S M E U L. Kushmar, breathing. And I want you to think Kushmar, yeah. K U S S M O M A U L. M A U L. Metabolic acidosis equals um, diabetes. So when diabetics are in their diabetic coma, they're in metabolic acidosis, and they push ball. Deep, rapid, and unlabored breathing. Deep, rapid, and unlabored. Of course, tachypnea is tachy. Nia, T A C H Y P N E A, and crepitus is the rice crispy air in the kitchen. Now, uh, now, uh, just a bit on the colors of sputum. Uh, you know, we all want colorless. Green is usually Pseudomonas. And Pseudomonas is our water bug that is in shower curtain heads, shower heads, water that sits around 24 hours. They say any water sits around 24 hours probably has Pseudomonas in it. Even sterile. <coughs> green mucus, sputum that's green colored by Pseudomonas. Creamy is probably stack. Creamy yellow. Rusty looking, kind of rusty, might be pneumococcal. Pneumococcal. Frothy, y'all always heard if they're frothy around their mouth is pulmonary edema. And I don't know, I think you can tell brown from rusty. Brown is probably old as well. You, if you're having to wonder, it's either, if you've 
same big breath here, burn it. And of course, I think you can tell if you're bleeding. Purple is Plexiella. K-L-E. B, as in boy. S-I-E-L-L-A. Plexiella. Now, I want to um, go over blood gases. Our last 15 minutes, let's do blood gases. And what I want you to know on blood gases, all I want you to know is um, the blood pH should be a 7. Uh, point 0.4, I'm sorry, 7.4. And do you realize that's a little bit basic? Because 7 is neutral. And anything under 7 in anything is acidic. Anything above 7 is basic or alkalitic. So our blood is just a touch basic, 7.4. So I want you to know that. I want you to know that our blood, to be good, the um, CO2, the carbon dioxide in there, that's the waste, should only be 35 to 45. And then our blood by carb, HCO3 by carb, 22 to 26. Now, Go on and write O2, PO2, that's the partial oxygen. O2, our arterial blood should be 80 to 100. You probably already knew that. We don't really need that to read our blood gases. So, with those norms and you can always look them up, but those are all you need to make an intelligent uh, blood gas analysis. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you some blood gases, and we're going to decide what state they're in and what needs to be done about it. So the pH of someone's blood is 7.24. The PCO2 is 83. And the HCO3 or the bicarb is 24. Now here are the three things I need to know. I need to know, number one, is this patient acidotic or alkalotic? Well, if 7.4 is normal, and they're a 7.24, they're acidotic. Mm -hmm. That's number one I need. So I know this patient's acidotic. Number two, is it respiratory or is it metabolic? Those are my choices. And here's the deal on the two. Respiratory, remember I told you we get rid of the waste, the CO2? And so that's a beautiful thing, but our respiratory system takes care of that. But if in three days, I say it's biblical, if three days it doesn't do, it can't do it, it asks the kidneys to help. And so in three days, if I can't get my blood back, respiratory throw off, then the kidneys automatically are asked to try to help me. And then it becomes metabolic. Is that wonderful or not? Then it becomes that. So what is this patient? Well, I gotta decide if it's respiratory or metabolic. And then I'll know how serious. If it's respiratory, it's not quite as serious as metabolic because it hadn't been going on three days. So here's the deal. The, they say you can use the word Rome, R-O-M-E. It's respiratory, R, if the pH and the CO2 are opposite. One's up and one's down. That's what I mean by opposite. 
R-O for run. Respiratory is down from 7.4, so it's down. PCO2 is up from the norm, 35 to 45, it's 85, 83. So I have the opposite, so it's respiratory. R-O. I can quit right now because this patient is in respiratory um, acidosis. If that wasn't true, let me go on to the M-E. It's metabolic if they both were doing the same thing. They both went down, they both went up. When I say both, pH and, and CO2, and CO2. Or if one stays in range, they're not opposite. They're, they're really not equal, they're just not cooperating. If one stays in range, they're not opposite, so it's called metabolic. Mm -hmm. So this patient is in respiratory acidosis, not metabolic. And the third question, I wanted to know if it was acidic or alkalotic. I wanted to know if it's metabolic or respiratory. And my last final thing is, are they okay themselves or do I need to In other words, are they fully compensating? Is he blowing off? Is he taking care of his kidneys? Kidneys and lungs, are they getting rid of the weight? That's full. And I know he's fully compensated. He's doing fine. Leave him alone if it's 7.45 is pH. And this patient is not 7.45, is he? It's 7.24. So he is not fully compensating. Let's go to the next one. He's partially compensating if all three are out of range. Well, we know pH is out of range or we would have made them fully. So PCO2 is out of range and HCO3 is out of range, isn't it? So all three are out of range, which means they're all three trying to help each other. So they're partially compensated. They may need a little help from the medical community. And our last choice is uncompensated. He flat needs help because he's not compensating at all. And that's when either PCO2 or HCO3 stay in range. They're not budging. One of them. Did one of these, oh, 22 to 24, HCO3 stayed in range. So I always describe it as it's a bully. He's going to do what he wants to do. He doesn't care if you're dying. He's going to stay in range. Thank you very much. So you're uncompensated. This patient is in respiratory acidosis, uncompensated. Okay, let's take another one. pH is. Uh, 7.58, PCO2 is 48, HCO3 is 36. Now don't jump ahead, take them exactly like I did. Is this patient acidotic or alkalotic? They're alkalotic. So they're alkalotic, number one. Number two, are they respiratory or metabolic alkalotic? Wrong. Respiratories are opposite. 7.58 is up from 7.4, but PCO2 is 48, and it was 35 to 45, it's up. So ME, metabolic, they're equally doing the same. They're not respiratory. So this patient is metabolic alkalosis. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now, are they compensated? That's the big thing. All right, is he fully 7.45? No, he isn't. He's not fully. But are all three out of range? So he's partial. Isn't that wonderful? Let's do one more, and then we're going to talk about what we're going to do about it real quick. One more. Um, seven point. Oh, yeah. 7.36 pH, P 
HCO2 30, HCO3 15. Now what I failed to tell you is that when you and I were looking at all this, there wasn't a range for pH. I told you 7.4, and that's what I want you to keep in mind. But when you're looking at fully compensated, that fully compensated does not need to be exactly 7.45. They say that one can be 7.45 For the compensation only, not for metabolic, not for anything else. I, I heard a lecture and she said on this deciding if they're acidotic or alkalotic, she said 7.39 is acidotic. It's exactly like you're partially pregnant or not. You are in acidosis if you 7.39. You can't say, well, that's just a little bit. No, she's acidotic. But for the fully compensated, I can look at the range. Okay. Did you get them? 7.36, PCO2, 30, and HCO3, 15. Okay, are they acidotic or alkalotic? Acidotic. 7.36 is below 7.4. Are they wrong? R-O. Resp are they respiratory? Is, are both of them oxygen? Is 7.36 is down? PCO2 was 35 to 45, wasn't it? And they were down. So they weren't opposite. It means it's metabolic. So this patient is in metabolic acidosis. Are they fully compensated? Yes, because it's 7.36. That's the only time you look at the pH range. Now, our last five minutes, let's go with what do we do about if there is issues. I told you, fully, please leave them alone. Partial, we need to do it. And un, un, uh, so let's take respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis. Um, with respiratory acidosis, they're not changing. So it's things like pneumothorax. We just don't have any And um, that's your COPDs, your that's your cardiac arrest, and you keep heart. That just think about it. If the, if they're not breathing well, they're not moving gases. They're just not exchanging gases uh, sufficiently. And um, so the treatment is a ventilator, a respirator. We've got to have a ventilator push through the, that pneumonia, push through uh, a pneumothorax. We got to have something push, so we need a ventilator. Metabolic acidosis, now that's like diarrhea, starvation. There's where your diabetes, anybody that's having diabetic issues, they're probably in, they're bordering on metabolic acidosis. So of course we can work the, the diabetic on that, but if it's di if it's diarrhea, starvation, electrolytes gone, the treatment's by car. And then respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory alkalosis. And if you'll just think of scared, not breathing very deep. You're just fever, pain, scared. People don't breathe very deep. Shallow breathing. This is respiratory outlet. The treatment is calm them down. Give them a bag to breathe through. Calm down. Instruct them to slow deep breaths. And metabolic alkalosis. Is again electrolytes are depleted. Might be an NG tube. We're just pulling 
They're constant. And maybe diarrhea again with this one. Metabolic alkalosis. And the treatment is sodium chloride or KCL.